Hadith or Arabic, Hadith Hadith Arabic pronunciation, Hadith Theta, place. Ahadith, Ahadith Ahadith Arabic pronunciation, Ahadith Theta, also, traditions in Islam are the record of the words, actions, and the silent approval, of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Within Islam the authority of hadith as a source for religious law and moral guidance ranks second only to that of the Quran, which Muslims hold to be the word of Allah revealed to his messenger Muhammad. Quranic verses such as 2454, enjoin Muslims to emulate Muhammad and obey his judgments, providing scriptural authority for ahadith. While the number of verses pertaining to law in the Quran is relatively few, ahadith give direction on everything from details of religious obligations such as ghusl or wudu, ablutions for salat prayer, to the correct forms of salutations and the importance of benevolence to slaves. Thus the great bulk of the rules of sharia Islamic law are derived from ahadith, rather than the Quran, hadith is the Arabic word for speech, report, account, narrative. Unlike the Quran, not all Muslims believe ahadith accounts or at least not all ahadith accounts are divine revelation. Ahadith were not written down by Muhammad's followers immediately after his death but several generations later when they were collected, collated and compiled into a great corpus of Islamic literature. Different collections of Ahadith would come to differentiate the different branches of the Islamic faith. A small minority of Muslims called Quranists reject all hadith, because some ahadith include questionable and even contradictory statements. The authentication of ahadith became a major field of study in Islam. In its classic form, a hadith has two parts the chain of narrators who have transmitted the report, the isnad, and the main text of the report. The matn. Individual hadith are classified by Muslim clerics and jurists into categories such as sahih, authentic, hasan, good, or daif, weak. However, different groups and different scholars may classify a hadith differently. Among some scholars of Sunni Islam, the term hadith may include not only the supposed words, advice, practices, etc. of Muhammad, but also those of his companions. In Shia Islam, hadith is the embodiment of the sunnah, the words and actions of the Prophet and his family the Al al bayt the Twelve Imams and the Prophet's daughter, Fatima. Etymology In Arabic, the noun hadith ipa, ash d theta means report, account, or narrative. Its Arabic plural is ahadith, ahadith ash ash d theta. Hadith also refers to the speech of a person. Topic <laughs> definition. In Islamic terminology, according to Juan Campo, the term hadith refers to reports of statements or actions of Muhammad, or of his tacit approval or criticism of something said or done in his presence. Classical hadith specialist Ibn Hajar al Asqalani says that the intended meaning of hadith in religious tradition is something attributed to Muhammad but that is not found in the Quran. Scholar Patricia Crone includes reports by others than Muhammad in her definition of hadith. Hadith. Short reports, sometimes just a line or two, recording what an early figure, such as a companion of the Prophet, known as Sahaba or Muhammad himself, said or did on a particular occasion, prefixed by a chain of transmitters. But she adds that nowadays, hadith almost always means hadith from Muhammad himself. Other associated words possess similar meanings including, kabar news, information often refers to reports about Muhammad, but sometimes refers to traditions about his companions and their successors from the following generation, conversely, athar trace, vestige usually refers to traditions about the companions and successors, though sometimes connotes traditions about Muhammad. However, according to the Shia Islam Alul Bayt Digital Library Project
when there is no clear Quranic statement, nor is there a hadith upon which Muslim schools have agreed. Shia refer to Alul Bayt for deriving the Sunnah of Prophet, implying that while hadith in limited to the traditions of Muhammad, the Shia Sunnah draws on the sayings, etc. of the Alul Bayt i.e. the Imams of Shia Islam. Distinction with Sunnah The word sunnah custom or all the traditions and practices of the Islamic prophet that have become models to be followed by Muslims is also used in reference to a normative custom of Muhammad or the early Muslim community. Joseph Schacht describes hadith as providing the documentation of the sunnah. Another source, Joseph A. Islam, distinguishes between the two saying Whereas the hadith is an oral communication that is allegedly derived from the Prophet or his teachings, the sunnah quite literally, mode of life, behavior or example signifies the prevailing customs of a particular community or people. A sunnah is a practice which has been passed on by a community from generation to generation en masse, whereas the ahadith are reports collected by later compilers often centuries removed from the source. A practice which is contained within the hadith may well be regarded as sunnah, but it is not necessary that a sunnah would have a supporting hadith sanctioning it. Some sources Khalid Abu Lfadl limit hadith to verbal reports, with the deeds of Muhammad and reports about his companions being part of the sunnah, but not hadith. Non-prophetic hadith Joseph Schacht quotes a hadith by Muhammad that is used, "...to justify reference." in Islamic law to companions of Muhammad as religious authorities. My companions are like lodestars. According to Schacht, and other scholars, in the very first generations after the death of Muhammad, use of hadith from Sahaba companions of Muhammad and Tabi'un successors of the companions was the rule, while use of hadith of Muhammad himself by Muslims was the exception. Shakt credits Al Shafi, founder of the Shafi'i school of fiqh or madhab, with establishing the principle of the use of the ahadith of the Muhammad for Islamic law and emphasizing the inferiority of hadith of anyone else, saying ahadith from other persons are of no account in the face of a tradition from the Prophet, whether they confirm or contradict it. If the other persons had been aware of the tradition from the Prophet, they would have followed it." This led to the almost complete neglect of traditions from companions and others. Collections of ahadith sometimes mix those of Muhammad with the reports of others. Muwatta Imam Malik is usually described as the earliest written collection of hadith but sayings of Muhammad are blended with the sayings of the companions, 822 hadith from Muhammad and 898 from others, according to the count of one edition. In Introduction to Hadith by Abd al-Hadi al-Fadli, Kitab Ali is referred to as the first hadith book of the al-al-bayt to be written on the authority of the Prophet. Hadith and Quran Importance of Hadith complementing the Quran The theological importance of Ahadith comes from several verses in the Quran, such as Say, Obey Allah and obey the Messenger, but if you turn away, he the Prophet is only responsible for the duty placed on him, i.e., to convey Allah's message and you for that placed on you. If you obey him, you shall be on the right guidance. The messenger's duty is only to convey the message in a clear way, and Nur 2454 
In God's Messenger you have indeed a good example for everyone who looks forward with hope to God and the last day, and remembers God unceasingly. Al-Azab 33-21 the Hadith literature is based on spoken reports in circulation after the death of Muhammad. Unlike the Quran, Ahadith were not promptly written down during Muhammad's life or immediately after his death. Hadith were evaluated and gathered into large collections during the 8th and 9th centuries, generations after the death of Muhammad, after the end of the era of the rightful. Rashidun Caliphate, over 1,000 kilometers (620 miles) from where Muhammad lived, many thousands of times more numerous than Quranic verse, ahadith have been described as resembling layers surrounding the core of the Islamic belief. The Quran, well-known, widely accepted hadiths make up the narrow inner layer, with ahadith becoming less reliable and accepted with each layer stretching outward. Unlike the Quran, ahadith are grounded in the prosaic moments of everyday life. The reports of behavior to be emulated that were collected include details of ritual religious practice such as the five Five solid obligatory Islamic prayers that are not found in the Quran, but also everyday behavior such as table manners, dress, posture. Hadith are also regarded by Muslims as important tools for understanding things mentioned in the Quran but not explained, a source for tafsir commentaries written on the Quran. Some important elements, which are today taken to be a long-held part of Islamic practice and belief are not mentioned in the Quran at all, but are derived solely from the Hadith. Almost all Muslims, therefore, can be called Hadithists i.e. believers in Hadith, and maintain that the Ahadith are a necessary requirement for the true and proper practice of Islam, as it gives Muslims the nuanced details of Islamic practice and belief in areas where the Quran is silent. Quranists, on the contrary, hold that if the Quran is silent on some matter, it is because Allah did not hold its detail to be of consequence, and that some ahadith contradict the Quran, evidence that some ahadith are a source of corruption and not a complement to the Quran. A classical example is Salat, the five daily prayers of Islam, which is commanded in the Quran, and considered by all Muslims to be an obligatory part of Islamic religious practice, one of the five pillars of Islam. Details of prescribed movements and words of the prayer known as rakat and how many times they are to be performed, are found in ahadith, demonstrating to hadithists that ahadith, validly, fulfill the Qur'anic command of ritual prayer. However, ahadith differ on these details and consequently salat is performed differently by different hadithist Islamic sects. Quranists, for their part, believe if Allah thought the details of salat to be consequence, would have included them in the Quran and that the details of salat are a matter between each individual Muslim and Allah, with correctly performed salat depending on a correct intention to perform the prayers, valid however it may be individually performed. Comparative importance of ahadith among most hadithists. The importance of ahadith is secondary to Quran, given that, at least in theory, an Islamic conflict of laws doctrine holds Quranic supremacy above ahadith in developing Islamic jurisprudence. However, a minority of hadithists have historically placed ahadith on a par with the Quran. A smaller minority have upheld ahadith in contradiction to the Quran, thereby placing ahadith above Quran and claiming that contradictory ahadith abrogate the parts of the Quran where they conflict. It has been narrated through a chain of narrators, including Muhammad ibn Ismail and originating with Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, that the Prophet Muhammad once addressed his people in Mina saying, O people, whatever comes to you in the form of my hadith, if it agrees with the holy book of Allah, it is genuine, but whatever comes to you that does not agree with the book of Allah you must know that I have not said it. Components, schools, types Impact The Hadith had a profound and controversial influence on tafsir commentaries of the Quran. 
The earliest commentary of the Quran known as Tafsir ibn Abbas is sometimes attributed to the companion ibn Abbas. The hadith were used in forming the basis of sharia the religious law system forming part of the Islamic tradition, and fiqh Islamic jurisprudence. The hadith are at the root of why there is no single fiqh system, but rather a collection of parallel systems within Islam. Much of early Islamic history available today is also based on the hadith, although it has been challenged for its lack of basis in primary source material and the internal contradictions of the secondary material available. Types. Hadith may be hadith qudsi, sacred hadith, which some Muslims regard as the words of God, Arabic Allah, or hadith sharif, noble hadith, which are Muhammad's own utterances. According to as Sayyid Ash Sharif al Jurjani, the hadith qudsi differ from the Quran in that the former are expressed in Muhammad's words, whereas the latter are the direct words of God. A hadith qudsi need not be a sahih sound hadith, but may be da'if or even madu. An example of a hadith qudsi is the hadith of Abu Huraira who said that Muhammad said, When God decreed the creation he pledged himself by writing in his book which is laid down with him, My mercy prevails over my wrath. In the Shia school of thought, there are two fundamental viewpoints of hadith, the Akbari view and the Usuli view. The Usuli scholars stress the importance of scientific examination of ahadith using ijihad while the Akbari scholars take all ahadith from the four Shia books as authentic. Components The two major aspects of a hadith are the text of the report the MATN, which contains the actual narrative, and the chain of narrators the ISNAD, which documents the route by which the report has been transmitted. The ISNAD was an effort to document that a hadith had actually come from Muhammad, and Muslim scholars from the 8th century until today have never ceased repeating the mantra, "...the ISNAD is part of the religion." If not for the Isnad, whoever wanted could say whatever they wanted. The Isnad means literally support, and it is so named due to the reliance of the hadith specialists upon it in determining the authenticity or weakness of a hadith. The Isnad consists of a chronological list of the narrators, each mentioning the one from whom they heard the hadith, until mentioning the originator of the MATN along with the MATN itself. The first people to hear hadith were the companions who preserved it and then conveyed it to those after them. Then the generation following them received it, thus conveying it to those after them and so on. So a companion would say, I heard the Prophet say such and such. The follower would then say, I heard a companion say, I heard the Prophet. The one after him would then say, I heard someone say, I heard a companion say, I heard the prophet. and so on. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Different schools. Different branches of Islam refer to different collections of hadith, though the same incident may be found in hadith in different collections. In the Sunni branch of Islam, the canonical hadith collections are the six books, of which Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim generally have the highest status. The other books of hadith are Sunan Abu Dawood, Jamie' at Tirmidhi, al-Sunan al-Sugra and Sunan ibn Majah. However the Malikis, one of the four Sunni schools of thought, Madhabs, traditionally reject Sunan ibn Majah and assert the canonical status of Muwatta Imam Malik. In the Twelver Shia branch of Islam, the canonical hadith collections are the four books, Kitab al-Kafi, Man la Yadaruhu al-Faqih, Tadib al-Akam, and al-Istibsar. In the Abadi branch of Islam, the main canonical collection is the Tartab al-Musnad. This is an expansion of the earlier Jami Sahih collection, which retains canonical status in its own right. 
The Ismaili Shia sects use the Daim al-Islam as hadith collections. The Ahmadiyya sect generally rely on the Sunni canons. Some minor groups, collectively known as Quranists, reject the authority of the hadith collections altogether. In general, the difference between Shia and Sunni collections is that Shia give preference to ahadith credited to the Prophet's family and close associates, al -al -bayt, while Sunnis do not consider family lineage in evaluating ahadith and Sunnah narrated by any of 12,000 companions of Muhammad. History, tradition and usage History Traditions of the life of Muhammad and the early history of Islam were passed down mostly orally for more than a hundred years after Muhammad's death in AD 632. Muslim historians say that Caliph Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa, Caliph of the Rashidun Caliphate, or third successor of Muhammad, who had formerly been Muhammad's secretary, is generally believed to urge Muslims to record the hadith, just as Muhammad suggested to some of his followers to write down his words and actions. Uthman's labors were cut short by his assassination at the hands of aggrieved soldiers in 656. No sources survive directly from this period, so we are dependent on what later writers tell us about this period. According to British historian of Arab world Alfred Guillaume, it is certain that several small collections of hadith were assembled in Umayyad times. In Islamic law, the use of hadith is now understood hadith of Muhammad with documentation, isnids, etc., came gradually. According to scholars such as Joseph Schacht, Ignaz Goldziher, and Daniel W. Brown, early schools of Islamic jurisprudence used rulings of the Prophet's companions, the rulings of the caliphs, and practices that had gained general acceptance among the jurists of that school. On his deathbed, Caliph Umar instructed Muslims to seek guidance from the Quran. The early Muslims, Muhahirun, who emigrated to Medina with Muhammad, the Medina residents who welcomed and supported the Muhahirun, the Ansar, the people of the desert, and the protected communities of Jews and Christians, all al -Dima. But did not mention Muhammad, according to scholars Harold Motsky and Daniel W. Brown. The earliest Islamic legal reasonings that have come down to us were, "...virtually hadith-free", but gradually, over the course of 2nd century AH, "...the infiltration and incorporation of prophetic ahadith into Islamic jurisprudence", took place, it was Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi known as al-Shafi who emphasized the final authority of a hadith of Muhammad, so that even the Quran was, "...to be interpreted in the light of traditions i.e. hadith, and not vice versa." While traditionally the Quran is considered above the Sunnah in authority, al-Shafi, "...forcefully argued," that the Sunnah stands on equal footing with the Quran." According to scholar Daniel Brown for, as al-Shafi'i put it the command of the Prophet is the command of God, in 851 the rationalist Mu'tazila school of thought fell from favor in the Abbasid Caliphate. The Mu'tazila, for whom the "'judge of truth was human reason' had clashed with traditionists who looked to the literal meaning of the Qur'an and hadith for truth. While the Qur'an had been officially compiled and approved, hadiths had not. One result was the number of hadiths began, "...multiplying in suspiciously direct correlation to their utility." To the quoter of the hadith traditionists quoted hadith warning against listening to human opinion instead of sharia, Hanafites quoted a hadith stating that, "...in my community there will rise a man called Abu Hanifa the Hanafite founder who will be its guiding light." In fact one agreed upon hadith warned that, "...there will be forgers, liars who will bring you hadiths which neither you nor your forefathers have heard." Beware of them. 
In addition the number of hadith grew enormously. While Malik ibn Anas had attributed just 1720 statements or deeds to the Muhammad, it was no longer unusual to find people who had collected a hundred times that number of hadith. Faced with a huge corpus of miscellaneous traditions supported differing views on a variety of controversial matters—some of them flatly contradicting each other—Islamic scholars of the Abbasid sought to authenticate hadith. Scholars had to decide which hadith were to be trusted as authentic and which had been invented for political or theological purposes. To do this, they used a number of techniques which Muslims now call the science of hadith. <laughs> Shia and Sunni textual traditions Sunni and Shia hadith collections differ because scholars from the two traditions differ as to the reliability of the narrators and transmitters. Narrators who took the side of Abu Bakr and Umar rather than Ali, in the disputes over leadership that followed the death of Muhammad, are seen as unreliable by the Shia. Narrations sourced to Ali and the family of Muhammad, and to their supporters, are preferred. Sunni scholars put trust in narrators, such as Aisha, whom Shia reject. Differences in hadith collections have contributed to differences in worship practices and sharia law and have hardened the dividing line between the two traditions. <laughs> Extent and nature in the Sunni tradition In the Sunni tradition, the number of such texts is somewhere between 7 and 13,000, but the number of ahadith is far greater because several isnad sharing the same text are each counted as individual ahadith. If, say, ten companions record a text reporting a single incident in the life of Muhammad, hadith scholars can count this as ten hadiths. So Musnad Ahmad, for example, has over 30,000 hadiths. But this count includes texts that are repeated in order to record slight variations within the text or within the chains of narrations. Identifying the narrators of the various texts, comparing their narrations of the same texts to identify both the soundest reporting of a text and the reporters who are most sound in their reporting occupied experts of hadith throughout the second century. In the 3rd century of Islam from 225 840ths to about 275 889ths, hadith experts composed brief works recording a selection of about 2 to 5,000 such texts which they felt to have been most soundly documented or most widely referred to in the Muslim scholarly community. The 4th and 5th century saw these six works being commented on quite widely. This auxiliary literature has contributed to making their study the place of departure for any serious study of hadith. In addition, Bukhari and Muslim in particular, claimed that they were collecting only the soundest of sound hadiths. These later scholars tested their claims and agreed to them, so that today, they are considered the most reliable collections of hadith. Toward the end of the 5th century, Ibn al qaisarani formally standardized the Sunni canon into six pivotal works, a delineation which remains to this day. Over the centuries, several different categories of collections came into existence. Some are more general, like the Musanif, the Mu Jam, and the Jami, and some more specific, either characterized by the topics treated, like the Sunan, restricted to legal liturgical traditions, or by its composition, like the Arba Iniyat, collections of forty hadiths. Topic: <laughs> Extent and nature in the Shia tradition. Shia Muslims hardly ever use the six major hadith collections followed by the Sunni, as they never usually trust many of the Sunni narrators and transmitters. They have their own extensive hadith literature. The best known hadith collections are the four books, which were compiled by three authors who are known as the Three Muhammads. 
The four books are, Kitab al-Kafi by Muhammad ibn Yaqub al-Kulaini al-Razi Man la yadaruhu al-Fiqi by Muhammad ibn Babuya and al-Tadib and al-Istibsar both by Sheikh Muhammad Tusi. Shia clerics also make use of extensive collections and commentaries by later authors. Unlike Sunnis, the majority of Shia do not consider any of their hadith collections to be sahih authentic in their entirety. Therefore, every individual hadith in a specific collection must be investigated separately to determine its authenticity. However, the Akbari school does take all hadith from the four books as authentic. The importance of hadith in the Shia school of thought is well documented. This can be captured by Ali ibn Abi Talib, cousin of Muhammad, when he narrated that, "...whoever of our Shia followers knows our Sharia and takes out the weak of our followers from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge hadith which we all al have gifted to them, he on the day of judgment will come with a crown on his head. It will shine among the people gathered on the plain of resurrection." Hassan al-Askari, a descendant of Muhammad, gave support to this narration, stating, "...whoever he had taken out in the worldly life from the darkness of ignorance can hold to his light to be taken out of the darkness of the plain of resurrection to the garden paradise. Then all those whomever he had taught in the worldly life anything of goodness, or had opened from his heart a lock of ignorance or had removed his doubts will come out." Regarding the importance of maintaining accuracy in recording hadith, it has been documented that Muhammad al-Bakir, the great-grandson of Muhammad, has said that, "...holding back in a doubtful issue is better than entering destruction. You're not narrating a hadith is better than you narrating a hadith in which you have not studied thoroughly. On every truth, there is a reality. Above every right thing, there is a light." Whatever agrees with the Book of Allah you must take it and whatever disagrees you must leave it alone." Al-Bakir also emphasized the selfless devotion of all al bayt to preserving the traditions of the Islamic Prophet through his conversation with Habir ibn Abd Allah, an old companion of Muhammad. He al said, O oh Habir, had we spoken to you from our opinions and desires, we would be counted among those who are destroyed. We speak to you of the ahadith which we treasure from the Messenger of Allah, O oh Allah grant compensation to Muhammad and his family worthy of their services to your cause, just as they treasure their gold and silver. Further, it has been narrated that Jafar al-Sadiq, the son of al-Bakir, has said the following regarding hadith, you must write it down, you will not memorize until you write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Modern usage The mainstream sects consider hadith to be essential supplements to, and clarifications of, the Quran, Islam's holy book, as well as for clarifying issues pertaining to Islamic jurisprudence. Ibn al-Salah, a hadith specialist, described the relationship between hadith and other aspect of the religion by saying, it is the science most pervasive in respect to the other sciences in their various branches, in particular to jurisprudence being the most important of them. The intended meaning of other sciences here are those pertaining to religion, explains Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, Quranic exegesis, hadith, and jurisprudence. The science of hadith became the most pervasive due to the need displayed by each of these three sciences. The need hadith has of its science as apparent. As for Quranic exegesis, then the preferred manner of explaining the speech of God is by means of what has been accepted as a statement of Muhammad. The one looking to this is in need of distinguishing the acceptable from the unacceptable. Regarding jurisprudence, then the jurist is in need of citing as an evidence the acceptable to the exception of the later, something only possible utilizing the science of hadith. Topic: 
Studies According to Bernard Lewis, "...in the early Islamic centuries there could be no better way of promoting a cause, an opinion, or a faction than to cite an appropriate action or utterance of the Prophet." To fight these forgeries, the elaborate science of Hadith studies was devised. Hadith studies use a number of methods of evaluation developed by early Muslim scholars in determining the veracity of reports attributed to Muhammad. This is achieved by analyzing the text of the report, the scale of the report's transmission, the routes through which the report was transmitted, and the individual narrators involved in its transmission. On the basis of these criteria, various classifications were devised for Hadith. The earliest comprehensive work in Hadith studies was Abu Muhammad al Ramahormuzi's al Muhadith al Fasil, while another significant work was al Hakim al Nasabiyuari's Marifat. Ibn al Salah's Ulam al Hadith is considered the standard classical reference on Hadith studies. Terminology, admissible and inadmissible hadiths By means of hadith terminology, hadith are categorized as sahih sound, authentic, da'if weak, or ma fabricated. Other classifications used also include, hasan good, which refers to an otherwise sahih report suffering from minor deficiency, or a weak report strengthened due to numerous other corroborating reports, and munkar denounced, which is a report that is rejected due to the presence of an unreliable transmitter contradicting another more reliable narrator. Both Sahih and Hassan reports are considered acceptable for usage in Islamic legal discourse. Classifications of hadith may also be based upon the scale of transmission. Reports that pass through many reliable transmitters at each point in the isnad up until their collection and transcription are known as mutawatir. These reports are considered the most authoritative as they pass through so many different routes that collusion between all of the transmitters becomes an impossibility. Reports not meeting this standard are known as ahad, and are of several different types. Biographical evaluation Another area of focus in the study of hadith is biographical analysis ilm al-rijal, lit. science of people, in which details about the transmitter are scrutinized. This includes analyzing their date and place of birth, familial connections, teachers and students, religiosity, moral behavior, literary output, their travels, as well as their date of death. Based upon these criteria, the reliability of the transmitter is assessed. Also determined is whether the individual was actually able to transmit the report, which is deduced from their contemporaneity and geographical proximity with the other transmitters in the chain. Examples of biographical dictionaries include, Abd al-Ghani al-Makdisis al-Kamal fi asma al-Rijal, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani's Tadib al-Tadib and al-Dahabi's Tadkarat al-Hufaz. Criticism Related article, Goldzihar on Hadith The major points of intra-Muslim criticism of the Hadith literature is based in questions regarding its authenticity. However, Muslim criticism of Ahadith is also based on theological and philosophical Islamic grounds of argument and critique. With regard to clarity, Imam Ali al-Rida has narrated that in our hadith there are matashabi unclear ones like those in Al-Quran as well as mukham clear ones like those of Al-Quran. You must refer the unclear ones to the clear ones. Muslim scholars have a long history of questioning the hadith literature throughout Islamic history. Western academics also became active in the field later on. See also 
Prophetic biography List of Hadith authors and commentators Criticism of Hadith Oral Torah